This is Something for the Pain, a podcast produced by Project Echo Idaho, made for Idaho's healthcare professionals working to prevent, treat, and facilitate recovery from opioid and substance use disorders throughout the GEM state. I'm your host, Sam Steffen. Well, the E stands for extensions, looking where we aim to be. CH is for community healthcare, the welfare you and me. Today we're kicking off Season 4 of our podcast. If you're just joining us, Season 1 of Something for the Pain focused on opioid use prevention, treatment, and recovery in Idaho's Valley County. For Season 2, we focused on perinatal substance use disorder. Our third season provided an overview of substances commonly associated with substance use disorders. For Season 4, we're going to be looking a little more closely at substance use disorders as they impact Idaho's teen and adolescent populations. We'll be bringing you eight recorded didactic presentations from Echo Idaho's 2023 Adolescent Substance Use Disorders series, as well as our Counseling Techniques for Substance Use Disorders series, delivered by our subject matter experts. Today's episode features a presentation by Dr. Kate Heil, Addiction Medicine Fellow at Full Circle Health in Boise, on the topic of mental illness and addiction. This lecture was recorded live on April 26, 2023, as part of Echo Idaho's Adolescent Substance Use Disorders series. Here to introduce today's presenter is Echo Idaho Program Manager, Shannon McDowell. Hello, everyone. My name is Shannon McDowell. I am a Program Manager here at Echo Idaho. We're excited for our session today. We have a great session on mental illness and addiction, which is going to be presented by Dr. Kate Heil, who is the Addiction Medicine Fellow with Full Circle Health. We're super excited to have her present on this topic. And Kate, I'll let you introduce yourself and take it away. Hello, I'm Kate Heil. I'm the Full Circle Health Addiction Medicine Fellow. And so I finished my family medicine residency through Full Circle, the NAMPA program. And then I decided to stick around and do some additional training in addiction medicine. Today, I am here to talk about mental illness and addiction. So basically, this is kind of an overview of the connection between the two and approach to treatment. My learning objectives for today are to be able to discuss the relationship between mental illness and substance use disorders. And then briefly at the end, I'll go over some substance-induced mental health conditions. I just kind of want those to be on folks' radar and be able to know that they exist and kind of be able to describe what that means. So in general, when I do presentations, I usually start with person-first language. So as we all know, there's a lot of stigma within both mental health and substance use disorder addiction treatment. And I try to focus on using person-first language. So rather than saying someone is an alcoholic or has alcoholic liver disease, I say person with alcohol use disorder or alcohol-induced liver disease, cirrhosis or hepatitis or something like that. I stress to folks that we hear patients using these words to describe themselves like alcoholic or drug user addict or something like that. I try not to use that in my practice because there have been studies that show when we use stigmatizing language the treatment plan will actually change. So the definition of addiction that I use is from the American Society of Addiction Medicine, or ASAM, which defines addiction as a treatable chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among the brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experiences. So I tend to describe myself to this definition of addiction because it is imperfect, but it really does capture some of the complexity that we encounter in our daily practice in folks with addiction. This is kind of more of the medical model or the medical definition of addiction. And then when I was getting ready to prepare this talk, I got a little bit into the weeds about other definitions. And I found that there's actually a lot of different definitions for adolescents. So the WHO, or World Health Organization, defines adolescents as between 10 to 19, and then young people as 10 to 24. The Society for Adolescent Medicine in the United States defines adolescents 
more broadly is ages 10 to 25. And the American Academy of Pediatrics defines adolescence as a person between 11 to 21 and a young adult as someone from 18 to 25 years old. So I just wanted to bring that up because sometimes in the literature, you will see different kind of age definitions for folks or different uses of the words adolescent or young adult, and they're not necessarily interchangeable. And because different studies are done after the age of 18, these definitions can affect some of our practices. And in general, if we're not going just by solely years, a way to define adolescence is the transitional bridge between childhood and adulthood that we all have to cross. And so in general, how exactly does addiction relate to mental illness? So I think a lot of us will probably see this in our clinical practice, no matter where we are. So whether that's in the exam room, counseling room, hospital, emergency room, residential treatment, anything like that, we will see a lot of co-occurring disorders or comorbid disorders. Or another word to describe it would be dual diagnosis. So that is when a person has been diagnosed with both a substance use disorder and a primary mental health or psychiatric disorder. So in general, it's over 50%, we think, of young adults with substance use disorders also have at least one co-occurring psychiatric disorder. And some of the other references that I looked at had even like as high as 75%, which seems pretty high. Whatever the numbers are, it just shows us that there is a, quite a bit of a connection there. And the reason why this is important is because it relates to the patient and how they're kind of living their lives. And it also relates to how we treat the patient. We know that co-occurring or comorbid Dual diagnosis disorders can exacerbate one of the other. And then as well, we know that co-occurring disorders also will worsen the outcomes for the treatment of the substance use disorder. Specifically, if there's a comorbid psychiatric disease, there's a higher risk of relapse, and there's just in general kind of a higher risk of suicide and harsh prognosis for their substance use disorder. And in general, it can be hard to treat both. But that needs to be the goal, kind of the, the wraparound services. And it can be hard to treat both at the same time because availability of different providers or the different resources that we have. And sometimes there can be a little bit of difficulty in getting the correct diagnosis in between. Is this a primary psychiatric disorder or is this more of a substance use induced disorder? The way that I kind of frame my thinking about substance use disorders or psychiatric disorders is a lot of them really begin by young adulthood. And especially with substance use disorders, we know that a lot of the kind of different behaviors that lead to the diagnosis of a substance use disorder later in life do begin in adolescence or young adulthood. And we know that the severity of the substance use disorder, especially with alcohol, does relate to how early in their life somebody has started using that substance. And so one way that we can think about substance use disorder is thinking about them as preventable or a way where we can intervene when they start um, or even prevent them from happening um, in the pediatric setting. So one way to think about substance use disorders in some folks is a pediatric or adolescent onset disease. When we think about the presence of a psychiatric disorder, that does increase the risk of development of a substance use disorder and then the persistence of it. So that kind of goes back into the difficulty of treating or the higher risk of relapse of a substance use disorder when there is a psychiatric disorder involved as well. We know from our studies and our clinical practice that substance use is more frequently seen in adults with mental illness as well. We know from studies that Treatment of childhood onset psychiatric disorders like ADHD, depression, or anxiety does reduce the risk of development of substance use disorder later in life. However, unfortunately, a lot of young adults with psychiatric conditions do not receive treatment. We do know also that one of the difficulties that we can have in diagnosing of some of our psychiatric disorders in childhood or just in general kind of later in life as well, 
A substance use can precipitate the development of psychiatric symptoms and substance use, whether that be intoxication or withdrawal, can also kind of mimic different psychiatric disorders as well. Young adults, just kind of in general, when we look at a kind of population study or statistics and things like that, we know that young adults have the highest rates of unemployment and not being insured in the United States, specifically out of any other age group. So that is, again, kind of relating to the transitional bridge between childhood, maybe being on their parents' insurance, and then having to kind of transition from more being taken care of to taking care of themselves. And sometimes things fall off the radar, such as health care. And so if someone is either unemployed or not insured or underinsured, obviously that makes financial barriers and other barriers to receiving treatment as well. So it can be kind of a higher risk time. We also know that that transitional period between childhood and adulthood, being parented to taking care of themselves, does have a higher risk of disengaging from healthcare. So some people may not restart treatment or go back to healthcare, go for their checkups, things like that, after they are moving through adolescence. And we do also know, just in general, that males in particular may not want to kind of admit to symptoms of psychiatric disorders or substance use disorders or accept treatment because of fear of stigma, and that's both publicly and internalized. And especially with immigrant or minoritized groups, we have information that, you know, stigma and discrimination and then disparities are also heightened in that population as well. I took this information from the SAMHSA website. So with regards to the incidence and prevalence under substance use disorders, in 2016, adolescents between the ages of 12 and 17, about 3.4% of them would meet criteria for a substance use disorder. And then the most common ones would be cannabis, tobacco, and alcohol. And then after that followed prescription amphetamines and then other types of stimulants. So definitely alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis would be the most common causes of meeting criteria for substance use disorder in the ages between 12 and 17. But the good news is in general, prevalence of teen substance use is declining. I looked at a study that showed it had been declining as of 2015. And then I was curious if that bore true still with but all of the changes from the pandemic, it looks like actually has been repeated. In general, the prevalence of substance use is declining in, in this age group, which is good. And then and another thing that I found was interesting, as of a study in 2017, studies had estimated that about one in eight children in the United States live with a parent with substance use disorder as well. So it's definitely prevalent in our society. Other psychiatric disorders that can um, occur with substance use would be something like conduct disorder, symptoms of a personality disorder, impulse control disorders, uh, psychotic disorders, learning disorders, and then intellectual disability. So now I wanted to talk more about specific mental health disorders that we think about and how they may relate to substance use disorders. So depressive disorders in particular are pretty common, we know, we see and treat this. Specifically, there can be kind of two different presentations. If you see a patient who has symptoms of depression, but they're also using a, a substance, let's think about, so is this a primary depressive disorder? Is this a primary psychiatric disorder that was going on before the patient started using substances, or is this a substance-induced mood disorder? And this can be kind of difficult because the two of them can present quite similarly. So when we think about substance-induced mood disorders, we need to think about certain substances that are you know, capable of causing these symptoms. The more common one for kind of substance-induced um, depressive disorder would be alcohol. So we know that folks can develop depression symptoms when they're ingesting quite a bit of alcohol. And one way to kind of 
work on the diagnosis, deciding, you know, is this a primary depressive psychiatric disorder or is this a substance induced mood disorder? We know that in adults, when abstinence occurs, substance induced mood or depressive symptoms will decrease or even go away over time. But that can take months to kind of totally suss that out. And we need to make sure that we are protecting the patient and assessing for safety and suicidality kind of while we are working on our diagnostic work up there. And then, of course, treating the alcohol use and supporting folks in their goals. We do also know in general that girls with a history of substance use disorder are three times more likely to develop a depressive disorder in their lifetime than girls without that history. And so that is something to kind of think about as a potential risk factor. Like if you are talking to a young girl in your clinic and find out that maybe they're they're drinking or using substances, then that would be something to kind of think, well, have you heard that there can be in the long term some development of depressive symptoms later in life? because of use of different substances. So that can be something kind of to incorporate in counseling as well. And then the next one I wanted to talk about was bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder can be kind of a tricky one just in general to diagnose. And as you probably know, bipolar disorder, the typical onset of it is in older adolescents, so in young folks. That's kind of, in general, the most common time when people have their first episode or that's when they tend to get diagnosed. And it can be difficult to diagnose in children and teens, just kind of in general, and then especially if there's a a co-occurring or comorbid substance use disorder. So if somebody is under the influence of different substances, whether that be intoxication or withdrawing from a substance, Some of those symptoms can mimic symptoms of a bipolar disorder. And so when we are trying to diagnose bipolar disorder, asking certain questions about like sleep or activity, impulsivity, things like that, we want to make sure that we're kind of clarifying and asking those questions like when you were not under the influence of a substance, did you still have these symptoms or was it only when you were using the substance? And then thinking about other types of risk factors, we do know that adolescents in particular, and not as much as in children when they are diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but more adolescents, are at a higher risk for developing a substance use disorder once they've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And some of that is kind of self-medication of symptoms and things like that. We do know um, alcohol in particular can be used by patients sometimes to regulate their media symptoms. So anxiety disorders and panic. Anxiety just in general is very common. And so anxiety disorders or panic disorders are very common conditions comorbid with substance use disorders, whether that be generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, social anxiety, Obsessive compulsive disorder and then PTSD kind of on its own also come over with um, substance use disorders. So similar to bipolar disorder, we know that use of certain substances and then withdrawal from certain substances can cause symptoms very similar to panic or very similar to anxiety. And so abstinence does need to be achieved prior to being able to fully and accurately diagnose someone with panic disorder. So let's say someone is withdrawing from a substance and they're really, really panicky. That makes sense because their body is used to the substance. They're feeling the physiologic effects of withdrawal. And that can make some of the symptoms of panic or anxiety. And so hopefully as time goes on away from treating the substance use disorder, the diagnosis will become more clear over time. And in general, for treatment or prescribing folks in the audience, if a person has a history of a substance use disorder, we recommend against using benzodiazepines like for long-term use of anxiety or panic in a person with a history of substance use disorder due to kind of their potential for physical dependence and addiction there. And then a little note here about eating disorders. 
we do know that about 25% of people who suffer from an eating disorder also have either a history of substance use disorder or current substance use disorder. And then we do know bulimia is more common than anorexia in this population. So moving from kind of more mood disorders, anxiety disorders to psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia, we do know that young folks who are experiencing psychotic symptoms kind of at a younger age, whether it be adolescents or teenage years, they are more likely to use substances to treat those psychotic symptoms. So I know earlier I talked about, especially with anxiety or panic disorders, it's important to have some time away from the substance time with abstinence prior to being able to fully diagnose panic disorder. But with schizophrenia, it's very highly recommended to treat both the psychosis and the substance use disorder at the same time in a co-occurring treatment model. So the treatments tend to kind of walk together. And then, like I said, folks with schizophrenia or psychotic symptoms are more likely to treat their symptoms with substances, especially if these symptoms begin at a young age. And the most common substances used would be alcohol or marijuana. And in ADHD, we do know from our different population studies that there is a higher amount of people who are diagnosed with substance use disorders who have a history of ADHD. So ADHD, we know, is overrepresented in folks with substance use disorders when compared to the general population. The reason why we think that this happens is there some dysfunction in the pathways in the frontal subcortical areas that occur with ADHD also contributes to substance use disorder vulnerability in those patients as well. We do know that ADHD is very common. It's one of the most common childhood psychiatric disorders. And then we think that it affects between 8 to 18% of children and adolescents worldwide. And then adolescents with ADHD, especially kind of the hyperactive or more impulsive type, having earlier onset of substance use. Successful treatment of ADHD in childhood does mitigate the risk of developing a substance use disorder later in life. When I was looking for principles of treatment or different like guidelines for substance use disorder treatment of adolescents, one resource that I found is Boston Medical Center, Pediatric Addiction Medicine Services. These are their overarching goals and what they recommend in general, kind of for the full treatment of substance use disorders in adolescents, kind of like something to aspire to. That would be young adults should receive integrated mental health and addiction care across treatment settings. So treating both mental health and addiction and whatever setting that we can get them in. We do think that their care should be responsive to the needs of young adults exposed to trauma and other adverse childhood experiences. And then, of course, monitoring their response to treatment. So treatment programs should regularly assess and respond to the evolving mental health needs, motivations, and treatment goals of young adults with co-occurring disorders. And then this was the recommendation. So if somebody has kind of a mild psychiatric disorder and a mild substance use disorder, and they talk about kind of treating that more in a primary care setting with some consultation and support from both mental health and addiction specialists. And then comparing that to where the substance use disorder severity is high as well as the psychiatric or mental health disorder is also high. So that would be the addiction medicine and mental health specialists working really close and together. So I wanted to talk very briefly about substance induced mental health conditions. So, we know based on the way that kind of substances work in the brain, especially the developing brain during adolescence childhood, so substances will put adolescents or young adults at risk of neuropsychiatric complications, whether that be psychotic disorders or cognitive function later in life or different mood disorders. So, there can be substance induced depressive disorders, substance use anxiety disorders, things like that. And then there are some specific DSM-5 substance-induced mental health conditions that you can diagnose folks with. 
whether that be psychotic or depressive, substance-induced mental health conditions, bipolar disorders, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive and related disorders because of a substance. And then specifically for hallucinogens, we have a separate one called hallucinogen persisting perception disorder. So one of the most important parts of the criteria is we can't just say, oh, they're using meth or whatever. And so this is why they have this mental health condition. It's not that easy. Um, We have to know that the substance itself specifically can cause those particular symptoms. So that would be, for example, like alcohol and depressive symptoms, things like that. And then we have to also be able to define the time course of when the symptoms developed and the time course of the use of the substance. So within one month of being intoxicated or using the substance or withdrawal from the substance or medication. Okay, and then just kind of an interesting example to wrap up. One of the things that there have been some kind of recent investigations into is the connection between marijuana and psychotic disorders, whether that be like substance-induced or the development of schizophrenia later in life or psychotic disorders later in life. We do know that marijuana intoxication can cause some psychotic symptoms, but then interestingly, there are some folks kind of looking into like a two-hit hypothesis or what's also called a component cause with marijuana and the development of psychosis symptoms later in life. So right now we are kind of wondering if adolescent user exposure to cannabis puts folks at risk of developing a psychotic disorder later in life, if those individuals already have kind of a risk factor for it, whether it be through family history or something like that. So we think right now the exposure or use of marijuana is not enough. It has to be in already vulnerable individuals who would already be at risk for developing psychosis. So that's kind of an interesting area of study that folks are looking into now. Thank you, Kate. Um, We've got time for one, maybe two questions. If you have them. I had a question for you, Kate. Speaking here is Caitlin Killingsworth, peer recovery coach and documentation specialist at Brick House Recovery and panelist for Echo Idaho's Adolescent Substance Use Disorders series. There's some kids I've worked with and before they would have diagnoses and they would go through their addiction and then when they get sober, they find that they may not have those diagnoses anymore. They may have changed since then. And a lot of the times they reflect back to the diagnoses they got when they were adolescents. Can you explain the importance of doing med management for adolescents, especially those that have issues with substance use early on to maybe prevent their addiction from going further? Have you seen any documentation of that or history of that? So the adolescent psychiatric diagnosis that they had prior to substance use, they felt like that one was more accurate? Yes, that's great. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense to me. And it kind of speaks to the, the complexity of all the kind of interactions that a person has in their life that could lead to whether substance use or a psychiatric disorder diagnosis. And certainly we do know that successful treatment of anxiety, depression, ADHD especially does mitigate the risk of developing a substance use disorder, whether they're being adolescents or young adulthood or later in life. And I think that what you're saying also kind of speaks to kind of the difficulty in diagnosis. So if someone was perhaps using substance and and got diagnosed with a different psychiatric illness, and then once they stop using the substance, they are feeling better, they've been sober, um, they don't feel like they fit criteria for that diagnosis anymore, um, it would be important to kind of work with them and, you know, like, well, maybe was this actually like a substance-induced thing that we were treating there um and then what i want to also point out is that i think that let's say a patient has um a substance induced depressive disorder or they have suicidality or something like that um i i don't want to 
give the impression that you shouldn't treat the depression um, until they're totally sober from alcohol, because I don't think that would be necessarily safe. Um, but it really is kind of a um, risk benefit discussion um, with the patient about, okay, so you are using alcohol. The, we know that this can cause some depressive symptoms. We're not really sure if the depression started before using the alcohol or if it started as a result of it. How can I best support you in this? So would that be counseling? Could I help you with medications potentially for depression right now? We do also know if there's a substance-induced um, depressive disorder and suicidality, said, I think it's called the risk of suicidality um, in substance use induced depression is just as serious as in not substance induced depression. So we need to be mindful of kind of like safety planning and things like that too. And having a risk benefit discussion with the patient on, do you want to pursue treatment for this psychiatric disorder right now? Or how do you feel about kind of waiting based on like your safety and things like that for treatment after um, absence? That again was Dr. Kate Heil, Addiction Medicine Fellow at Full Circle Health in Boise, presenting Mental Illness and Addiction. That lecture was recorded live on April 26, 2023, as part of Echo Idaho's Adolescent Substance Use Disorders series. If you'd like to watch the Zoom recording of that presentation, that video is currently available on the Echo Idaho YouTube channel, which you can access through our website. Information about how to contact some of the organizations and services mentioned in that talk is available in our podcast show notes on our podcast webpage, www.uidaho.edu slash echo hyphen podcast. If you're interested in joining our free live echo sessions to receive continuing education credit, learn best practices, ask a question, or grow your community, please visit our website at www.uidaho.edu slash echo where you can register to attend, sign up to receive announcements, donate, and find out more information about our programs. Season 4 of Something for the Pain is brought to you by Echo Idaho, supported by the Whammy Medical Education Program and the University of Idaho, and is made possible with funding provided by BJA, the Bureau of Justice Assistance. We here at Echo also want to hear your feedback. We welcome your questions, comments, and suggestions and invite you to email us at echoidaho at uidaho.edu. And don't forget to subscribe to Something for the Pain using your podcast app. And if you have a moment, write us a review. Something for the Pain was supported by grant number 15PBJA21GG04557COAP, awarded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. The Bureau of Justice Assistance is a component of the Department of Justice's Office of Justice Programs, which also includes the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the National Institute of Justice, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, the Office for Victims of Crime, and the SMART Office. Points of view or opinion opinions in this recording are those of the author and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the U.S. Department of Justice. You can earn CE credit while you sit and eat your lunch. Well, the, the contributing voices on today's episode were those of Shannon McDowell, Kate Heil, and Caitlin Killingsworth. We'd also like to thank all of our listeners, without whom none of this would be possible. Without you, we'd just be talking to ourselves. C-H-O all together, well, you know what that spells. Echo Idaho, sign up for our free sessions, there's a handful every month. Echo Idaho, you can earn CE credit while you're sitting.